Hi, I'm Greg Sando, and I'm sitting here with Robert Levine, who is the principal violist for the Milwaukee Symphony. But actually, that is only the beginning of what he does. Why don't you tell the assembled masses here everything you do? Um, I am the president of the Milwaukee Musicians Association, which is local aid of the AFM. And I am the alternate Ixam delegate from the orchestra. Um, I am former chair of Ixam. I was chair of Ixam for six years and editor of the newsletter for three. And as of January, I'm a member of the league, member of the board of the American Symphony Orchestra League. Which is certainly a new development in this field where you have musicians not only serving on the boards of orchestras themselves, but serving on the board of the ASOL, the service organization that to some extent represents all orchestras. And of course now some people would say that that is a conflict with your union activity, that you're required to take a more management-friendly position when you're working with orchestra managers at the league, and of course you have to be their antagonist when you work in the union. But maybe this isn't necessarily the case. Well, I don't, actually, I don't think either of those extremes is necessarily the case. Um, I did, when I received the invitation to join the league board, I thought about it at length, um, in part just because I had been very critical of the league in the past, in part because I knew that the league was trying to change direction and was reaching out and wondered if this was something I wanted to be part of and could help with, and in part because there was not a potential legal issue of whether a union officer could serve in that capacity, which I resolved. The league, in fact, is not intended, I think, or structured as a management organization. It's really designed to represent the whole field. That's its charter from Congress. That's its function under tax law. And I think that's what the leadership of the League is trying to do. But, you know, through all of those roles, except actually being a violist, the point was to advocate for musicians. And one of the things I've learned over time is that it's really not enough to advocate for musicians that musicians will not thrive if the institutions are not strong. But making the institution strong is not the same thing as, you know, coming down on the musicians either. Um, you mean management coming down right. on the musicians? I, I sense very little belief on the management side in this field, whether at the league or anywhere else, that the real solution to the problem with orchestras is paying musicians less. Although, although there are some that th think that, but that's not really where the league is going. I don't think that's where the field is going. I think it's more how do orchestras as institutions adapt to the new realities, and I think musicians should be a part of that conversation. Apparently there are new realities. I think we all know what many of them are, and financial press pressure on <clears throat> classical music institutions, orchestras maybe more than others, that is part of the reality. And I think picking up on some other things that you said, it's important to remember that an industrial model, for lack of a better term, might not hold here. That you don't have a large and very wealthy corporation with a unionized workforce. And the unionized workforce not particularly getting involved with how exactly the corporation makes its money and whether the new product in introduction last week was a good idea or not. Orchestras seem to require in the present phase a little bit of a more cooperative attitude from everybody. Would you, is that true as you see it? Well, I don't know that it was ever really healthy for you know, the musicians and management to be constantly at odds over every issue. There is a way in which orchestras are, are almost prototypically an industrial workplace, which I think is why unionization is so universal in our field. 
um, you know, we have one boss stands in front of us, and you know, the, the conductors are probably the best union organizers that God ever invented. Um, you know, the orchestra in its natural, in, in the wild, probably represents is is more like a plantation than than anything else. So, symphony musicians are kind of natural unionists. But having said that, it's also true that the it's not a for-profit enterprise. And I think my experience has been that one of the problems of the orchestras is that they look so much, both to musicians and to managements and to boards, as for-profit enterprises, that they really forget that the bottom line is not the bottom line. I mean, orchestras, not only do they have payroll, but they have big marketing budgets, they're out there competing with for-profit enterprises. They look a lot like small businesses. And it's very easy for board people who often come from business to come in and say, well, in my business, if you're losing money, you would do this. You cut this, cut that. And I think a lot of the job of managements and even musicians is to come in and say, look, we're, this is not about making money. We break even in order that we can play concerts. We don't play concerts in order to make money. Our bottom line is putting on quality concerts we run ourselves or try to run ourselves in a fiscally responsible fashion so we can continue to do that mission. But, you know, we're not about making widgets so we can make money and if we don't make enough, if widgets don't sell, we'll make something else. You know, what we do is do concerts. Right. And some of the classic examples of the wrong way to think about it would be, okay, this is a little comical, but let's have only one bassoonist play right. instead of two. Or, God help us, three or four. There's that, that classic story, which is now floating around the Internet, about the efficiency experts that come in and look at the yes. orchestra and say, well, half the violins aren't playing anything half the time. You don't really need them, and the bassoons are all playing the same part most of the time. So, you know, you get the orchestra down to about six people. Right. And, yeah. you know, in a sense, they're right, but it's, it's a sense that really misses the point. And let's pay, pay the harpist less right. because he or she is not playing very much. Right. So that would be another but I think that stuff, although God knows I have heard of it coming up for board members in real time, oh, yeah. but oh, still yeah. it functions more, <laughs> luckily, as comic relief right. than as a serious problem well, in the you, industry. You hope it does. If it's, you it, hope it. Where it becomes a serious problem, you have an institution in serious trouble. You, you really do, because you have whoever is making these arguments doesn't understand how the institution right. functions in right. its most crucial Operation. And yet, you know, one can understand it because sitting in a finance committee meeting, and I've done that in orchestras, you're talking about, you know, is this series generating enough money to support it? You're making decisions often that look exactly like decisions that would be made in for-profit companies. And you have to keep reminding yourselves, and more importantly, the board and the staff, that yes, but the goal is not to make money. The goal is to put on concerts. We have to make it work financially to right. do that. The goal is to put on concerts which have a certain set personnel right. requirement. Right. And yes, you might by attrition cut out a couple of violinists and you could do fewer concerts in the course of a season that required extra players. But basically your core is your core and it's sizable and you really can't cut it down without making the whole operation. Pointless. I've, I've been looking for a long time for an analogy that would really make sense to board people. And I, for a long time I looked at libraries. You know, nobody expects libraries to make money. Libraries exist to serve the public in a specific way, to fill a need that can't be filled otherwise. And, and I think that's a good analogy, but maybe more to the point, and this is, this is a weird analogy, but orchestras are kind of like sidewalks. Because, you know, nobody thinks about sidewalks as being profit centers. Sidewalks don't make money, but you can't have a city without them. You can't have a city without sidewalks. You can't, in the same way, you can't have a city without orchestras, even though, you know, orchestras are like sidewalks that charge tolls. But you don't think about sidewalks from a profit perspective. You think about them from, this is what a city has to have in order to be a city. Right, and... I think now of an old friend of mine who works in the pop music business. He lives in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York, and he's told me a couple of times how thrilled he is that there is a Brooklyn Philharmonic Orchestra because, he says, 
I don't, is I don't want my kids to grow up in a community that doesn't have an orchestra. Do they go to these concerts? No, they don't. But the orchestra represents something. And I think what it represents in this case is a kind of view of something better mm -hmm. than everyday life, something that exists for its own sake for, in a sense, a higher purpose, and it's good to have that around. Well, you know, there are things in Milwaukee that, that I don't go to. I mean, I, I've never been to a hockey game, but I'm glad there's a hockey team in town, and not just because it's good for business. I think it's an important resource to have. Well, a lot of people like hockey, and also it's a mark of a first-rate right. town. Right. Mark of a first-rate town. Right. So now it occurs to me to ask you, because you have so many strings to your bow, so many things you do, to take some issue that faces orchestras and ask you how it plays out from the point of view of you as a union official, you as an ASOL, ASOL board member, and then you simply as the leader of the okay. viola section. What, what well, issue I've, should I've we got take? a perfect one. Um, you probably know that last October we became the first American orchestra to put archival material up for sale on the Internet. Yes. We went live on iTunes October 3rd, 4th, somewhere around there. And it was all material from our radio broadcast. It was nothing that had been released commercially. Well, that actually was a real interesting confluence for me of my various roles because, first of all, that was a result of a labor agreement that I had helped write back in 2000 that Ixam and the Federation and, to a lesser extent, the smaller orchestras and the major managers had negotiated, the Internet agreement. And it, it kind of sat there on the shelf. Nobody had used it. So I had... You know, I had a role in doing that, and I'd learned an awful lot about why it was important and, and how to do it. parenthetically here, for people who may not know, what did this agreement change? What did it say? Well, basically, there was no agreement to cover material being put on the Internet. And at the time, in 2000, 99, 2000, there was... Recorded a, material. Well, or even live material. Or live material. Right. But, but the point is, recordings of the music... Or, musical performances right. that the musicians need to be able to control the income from. That we call electronic media product. Right. And right. the musicians musicians had always been paid for that in whether it had been radio or television or most important of recordings. You know, what we used to call phono. In fact, the, the name of the recording still for those of us that have been around for a long time, the, the, the CD agreement we refer to as phono labor mm -hmm. because... We spent so many decades referring to it as era of labor, the and now it's something else, and I can never right. remember what it is. But there was no way to put stuff on the internet uh, and have people paid for it. And the federation was getting a lot of interest from orchestras, who were getting a lot of interest from outside funders, and to some extent from board people saying, "Why aren't we on the internet?" And there were various venture capitalists running around with some very off-the-wall schemes, which we heard most of. None of which, I think, except maybe for Andante, came to any kind of fruition. These are schemes to set up companies that would market this stuff on the Internet. Yes, and there was one guy who wanted to put cameras in all the halls and tape, you know, film all the concert, concerts live and put them on the Internet right. video. And, and Andante.com, which was right. a very, very ambitious site, which did stream, I guess, Vienna Philharmonic and, and Philly. Philadelphia Philly Orchestra. Philly was actually the first American orchestra to use the Internet agreement right. at all. But, but they the, used it as the problem was this was um, Dante did not have much income, and so eventually they Well, I disappeared. think there was another problem, too, which was deeper, which was that streaming, streaming fit the technology at the time because of bandwidth limitations. But as soon as people got bandwidth, what they wanted to do was own material. Right. And they wanted to own high-quality material, which which is hard to do streaming. You you can, but right. it's... Right. So, back... You mean people, consumers, yeah, listeners. Right. Absolutely. Right. So, now, getting back to... Okay. You, the, you were involved in negotiating right. the Internet agreement well, that is, made this possible. Right. And then we had a internal media summit in the orchestra, which I was basically just invited as president of the local and somebody that knew media. We were talking about... Actually, not Internet, more recordings after we'd done our Hansel and Gretel, which was a lovely recording, which hasn't sold very many copies. But This was a regular CD release? It was actually a CD of a, of a radio performance we did for um, World of Opera, mm -hmm. for NPR. Yeah. And we turned it into a, into 
Actually, it was the first recording of Hansel and Gretel in English for decades. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful recording. It really came out well. It hasn't sold, but maybe it will. And we were looking for other things to do. And one of the, our actually our artistic advisor at the time brought in that another one of his clients um, was looking for material to put on the Internet because they had an arrangement with iTunes. And my ears pricked up and said, oh, we have, you know, we could do that. And again, because I'd spent so long as part of negotiating this contract and learning about the various possibilities, I was more clued in probably than and anybody in the room could have been because they hadn't spent that time. So I got everybody excited about it, which wasn't hard, because nobody had done it. We really would have been the first. And not only was it worth doing, but it's for an orchestra like mine, it's definitely worth doing something big for the first time because you get press and recognition and image that you can't get any other way. So we pushed through this all. Um, I was functioning partly as union president, partly as representative internally of the musicians because we had an elected media committee, um, partly artistically because we had to pass on all these recordings. Part of the deal was that everybody approve all the recordings so that the musicians had complete approval, which we don't have with radio, we don't have with CDs. Um, this was really one of the radical things, well, radical, interesting things about the Internet Agreement was the degree of control it pushed down to the local level and how open it was. Basically, every aspect of the deal had to be agreed to locally. Compensation, repertoire, even the choice of distributor, you know, had to be approved by the musicians. It was like a real, it was maybe the first time in my orchestra we'd ever done anything truly collaborative that actually resulted in something. Yeah. I mean, truly collaborative, yeah. not just management making the decisions and musicians may be participating right. or saying so yes or no to some aspects. One thing that really stands out for me as you recount this is the thought that musicians would have to approve the way that the recordings be distributed. Yep. Because normally, obviously, that wouldn't happen. Right. You know, management makes a recording and usually then the record company right. decides who distributes it. Oh, yeah. Well, so and, and how, how did it happen that management was willing to allow the musicians to have in effect, a veto power here, because being devil's advocate or worst-case scenario, scenario Ising, I say the musicians get unreasonable. The musicians refuse to agree to some method of distribution because they have grandiose ideas that it should be better. So why did management Well, agree? on the local level, they agreed because they didn't have any choice, because that, although I think they might have anyway, but that's the way the agreement is written, the Internet agreement. Mm -hmm. On the national level, it was in part a reaction on both musicians and management's part to the fact that we had been doing recordings for 50 years and had seen very little benefit from it aside from whatever money it brought in. I mean, it was a classic story of, and I think it might have been Philly, it might have been some other orchestra that went to Europe and, you know, there were no recordings on, on sale in the lobby, even though they just made a bunch for their big record company. And they complained to the management, and the management complained to the record company, and they went back next year, and they went out in the lobby, and there were lots of recordings by the London Symphony Orchestra on sale of the repertoire they were doing. The record company didn't care if the orchestra benefited from those recordings. And there was a feeling on both sides that we had essentially bartered away our artistic inheritance and our artistic history for, you know, a... a What's the biblical saying? Yeah, you know, a mess of pottage. A mess of the pottage, thank you, exactly. Phrase. And it gotten very little. So with the Internet Agreement, one of the things we tried to do was really favor self-produced recordings that were owned by the institute, owned and controlled by the institution. Okay, now one backward step we better take here because I myself am not really clear on it. A national agreement to which the AF of M is one party, who negotiates that with the AF of M? Who, well, who is okay. the management that signs the off? Management, the management, well, it, in a sense, it's an ad hoc group. It's a multi-employer group that forms for the purpose of negotiating a multi-employer agreement. In practice, there's a group of 40 or 50 orchestras that band together. They have a media committee. They elect a chair. They send people. It's not always the same group to every agreement. 
But I think there were some signif- 65 signatory orders, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. both big and small. And so the agreement is not binding on those that did not sign? Correct. But in most labor agreements, it says you can't do media except under right. the AFM agreement. Right. So even non-signatory orchestras, in a sense, they become were bound, bound by, by it. it. Although, you know, legally that, that gets a little squirrely sometimes. So this is fascinating. You were involved in this, and it really is, in its quiet way, epic-making change oh, yeah. in how recordings are made. Because, oh, yeah. of course, the situation with recordings <clears throat> in American orchestras is that very few were being made. Right. The classical record business has fallen on very difficult right. times. And the agreements which, at the time they were negotiated, made sense about what musicians' pay should be, were one of many factors that made it difficult or almost impossible to make a commercial recording with an American orchestra, or so it well, said. Well, so it, so it said. I, I, I think, unfortunately, the labor issues have often been used by some managements as an excuse. And it's also true that in some orchestras, the musicians were less willing to work to make it possible. There are orchestras like Cincinnati, Nashville... Atlanta, that have done a lot of recording, they've done it under what are called electronic media guarantees. Um, and, you know, they've done it very successfully for a long time. And they're still getting compensated. They're getting compensated in a slightly different form. It's structured differently. Um, and, you know, it involves some local negotiation. One of the things, I, to some extent, I think, there were thinking on both sides of the table at the Internet Agreement was that we wanted to encourage real collaboration on the local level. And in a sense, if an orchestra couldn't collaborate, that was a disincentive. I mean, they couldn't make Internet product. That was right. an incentive and to then to collaborate. What I see happening here is a sea change in the industry about the nature of recording. Right. Recording right. does not mean anymore we are going to go to the studio, we're going to record commercially a CD, it will be put on sale in record stores. Right. Less this is not how it's happening, and so new forms and new procedures have to emerge. And what you're saying is that it's very crucial for the musicians to, number one, agree to what these new forms are going to be and how the musicians will be involved and how the musicians will be compensated. But it's also important for the musicians, if possible, to have a hand in creating these. And so here we come back to you a working musician, a union official, and now a member of the board of the ASOL. And I had asked you, and but it ought to be clear to everybody listening now, all the ways in which your different roles can have you play a differing but really essential part in the evolution of this very important new thing in the classical music business. Well, that's that's the theory, anyway. I'm, no, I'm still I'm, I'm still working at, at making it work properly. Well, but of course, and it does get confusing. I mean, we, for example, I've because we were first, I've gotten calls from managements about how to do this. And my response has been, look, go set up an LIOC, a local internet oversight committee, with musicians on it, and I'm happy to talk to you. I don't want to be a union person talking to a management about the kind of deal they should strike with their musicians. Um. But on the other hand, I want, you know, I'm more than happy to help them. They, but they have to be working together first. Right. And when, you know, I'm doing a presentation along with some other people at the League conference in a few weeks on this subject, and that's the same message. You know, the subject of how to get your to management get, to set this up. Well, how, to, how to get how to, on the Internet. How to get on the Internet. Right. But the first step is, you know, you have to work collaboratively. And, and part of that is a trade-off for the musicians accepting that media work is not going to pay what it used to pay. When it was paying... Double, you know, when you go into a studio and get double your per service scale, musicians really didn't care so much about how it's been used, even though they should have. But now that that direct economic incentive is not there, now that the institutions are understanding that we make media to help the institution do its core mission, which is put on concerts, then we have to be part of those decisions. Right. So, returning to your many hats, I can see that when you are working as a union official on the negotiation of the Internet Agreement that you see, in general, the ways that musicians will have to be involved 
and the things that they should be saying and re- saying to management and requiring from management. Then, when you are a musician in the Milwaukee Symphony, you have to actually play a role in putting this in practice. Does it start to look different? It does a little bit. Um, having said that, though, I think it's, it's also true any negotiation, any fruitful negotiation, certainly in a labor negotiation, both sides have to really internalize some of the position of the other side. That, you, you know, you really can't in good conscience say yes to a management proposal short of having a gun pointed at your head unless you believe there's some merit to it. You have to understand the management point of view, and the, and the managements really have to internalize the musicians' concerns too. Having said that, yes, I, I, I do... I think I've become somewhat more sympathetic to not management concern so much, but the difficulty of of the management process, the fact that there are so many people involved and they're all doing full-time other things. And one of the, the real learning curve for me has been the fact you can't just say, well, make it happen, and everybody runs off and makes it happen. In fact, um, everybody's got not only lives outside the orchestra, but they've got full-time jobs in the orchestra, and this is one more thing on top of it. And so a lot of what's... I mean, I don't want to take more credit than I deserve, but a lot of this has happened because I have had the time and the interest to push it. And if it didn't... I've essentially kind of become the champion of this within the orchestra. Um, And sometimes that does involve a little... like looking like management, I'm, I'm afraid. Certainly understanding their concerns, but even more important, understanding their constraints. And I think the biggest constraint on management in my orchestra and most orchestras is simply time. Not even money, because money you can work around, but if there's not the time done, available to get the work done, Uh, it's not going to happen. This is true, I think, throughout the classical music business, that um, people, even large organizations, are understaffed for what they need to do and what's first going to suffer is a new initiative because everybody is fully employed and probably overemployed under well you know what you know what i mean there is more work than they can do understand just, than overworked yes, yes. <laughs> just doing what it is they have always done right. to keep the organization functioning now somebody comes along and says oh you need to be marketing in a new way right. to a whole new group of people and one of the first thoughts is going to be where are we going to find the time and the people to do this, and the same with new initiatives in recording. It's the management guru, Peter Drucker, um, who was a favorite author of mine. One of his early books, I believe, was called The Effective Executive. One of the very first lines he says, the problem with planning is that you have to use exactly the same hours to plan that you're using basically to put fires out every day. And I think it's doubly true of new initiatives. What helped us in Milwaukee was the fact that we did have this opportunity to be first. We did have all the pieces in place. And although we didn't have a lot of money, there was some management time available and some real interest in them in working on this. So we were able to put the pieces together, but it was not easy. So you can negotiate the outlines of it as a union executive. Then you can start seeing what it's like to put in practice right. as a member of the Milwaukee Symphony and as one who's very active in these affairs. And then you can bring what you've learned from both perspectives to the board of the American Symphony Orchestra League. The most interesting moment for me in the whole process, I think, was actually when we had to negotiate the money. Because that's when it looked most traditional. We were, it was two of us in a room with the manager, and you know we were basically just horse trading to come to a figure in the middle, and he would go off and talk to his boss, and we'd go out in the hallway and caucus. And, you know, we, write, we, we, we arrived at a compromise figure that wasn't really satisfactory, I think, to either party. But once we got the money done, everything else after that was almost completely collaborative. Hmm. Then it became non-traditional. But money is always, it, it is inherently a zero-sum game. It's the game. root of all evil. Didn't you know that? Well. No, but seriously, <laughs> no. What it, it would money, be more so if there was any money in this internet yeah, product, really. which so far but hasn't been. What much. money is is the source of difficulties and a very hard thing for people to talk about. Right. Particularly friends, particularly family. This is why there are prenuptial right. agreements and why I've learned in my own work 
that the most important person to have a contract with is your best friend yeah. you just started a project with. Right. with. Right. So now let me ask you a tricky question. You all in the Milwaukee Symphony, I believe, were the first to have archival recordings on iTunes. Right. And now the LA Philharmonic and the New York Philharmonic have some, and these have proved to be bestsellers, some of them on iTunes. Some of them have done pretty well, yeah. And yours perhaps were not. No, not is the this same something, way. Is this something that you all at the Milwaukee Symphony, the musicians, can be concerned about? Do you go to management and say, how come we didn't do better? It hasn't happened yet, um, and I'm not sure it will. I think one of the interesting things about media, and it's always been the case, but I think it's more the case now, is that it means very different things to different orchestras. It's not any surprise to me, or I don't think it should be to anybody, that the New York Phil is going to sell more on iTunes than we did. They, they, they haven't sold nearly as much, my understanding, as the LSO has, but the LSO has got much more content up and has been at it longer. Fact is, the New York Phil LSO Phil being the London, London Symphony Orchestra, yeah. and they were really the first to yeah. do this. Um, the New York Phil, the LA Phil, they've got a bigger audience base. They've got a bigger local market. Even in the CD days, orchestras largely sold to their local market. Even when it was, you know, a big company, most many of the sales were coming from their local. Oh, market. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, makes it, sense too. It does. I think what's happening. And, and the vision I have of, of our being on the Internet is that we're going to use it to intensify the relationship between us and our audience and our donors. It's not primarily about selling thousands of copies of something to people in France, although I understand that, that we've actually done quite well on iTunes France for some <laughs> reason. <laughs> Maybe we're going to be the Jerry Lewis of American orchestras, you know. But... You know, it, it's not. I don't think it's a competition between us and the New York Phil. And, and realistically, and I can say this with a very good conscience, because as you know, I was in Milwaukee doing your Brahms Festival, doing some pre-concert lectures, and I heard you all play, and you were terrific. It's good Those were very it's impressive very orchestra, yeah. concerts. But even so, you just don't have the media clout no. of a New York Philharmonic or no. an LA Philharmonic. They also had a major record label behind them that was marketing very heavily on iTunes, which is a fascinating story in itself because Universal, the record label involved here, is the only classical music institution I know of that has really figured out a couple of things about marketing to a younger audience. They actually have MySpace.com right. pages for some of their right. classical stars. So they were the right ones to be with. So obviously you will never be in a position that a New York Philharmonic can be in, but the local stuff we is need really crucial. We don't need to be. Yeah, because you're not selling to that audience. And also, one of the things I think will happen is that, I mean, one of the most exciting things that happened with the launch was that a world premiere we had done three weeks before was part of the launch. This is a way of getting new music up, unusual music up quickly, and making it available in a way that traditional distribution never could. Because we do not have to ship a copy of Roberto Sierra Third Symphony, the CD, to every record store in France for everybody in France to have access to it now. I think the most interesting thing about the Internet is that a lot of the resource, and a lot of the bottlenecks that have been traditional obstacles to orchestras being distributed in the past are gone. When, in the LP days, one of the main bottlenecks, I understand, was actually the pressing plants. There weren't very many pressing plants. There was a real capacity constraint. With CDs, that kind of went away. Then it became a distribution constraint. Now there, there's neither. There's not a distribution constraint. There's not a capacity constraint. The biggest problem may be in five years a that glut. there's so much product a out glut. there that there's exactly. no way of navigating through it. It may be that that's where the curatorial function comes back into it. It does, but this is where the local side of it right. becomes crucial. You all are the Milwaukee Symphony. Right. You function in Milwaukee. Right. You try to interest people in Milwaukee. Right. And now the fact that they can go on your site and hear music and go on iTunes and hear your music well, and becomes really crucial. And we're, the, the thing we're up to now is we're starting our own store, online store, which mm -hmm. we can do and still sell on iTunes. Right. So that... Instead of just selling a piece to somebody on iTunes, we don't know any of 
something about that person. We can sell a piece to somebody, and if they're in Milwaukee, we you can have, know about yes, this. You have their email address. If they bought Mozart, we can say, you know, we're doing Mozart next week. You want to come? Um, we can reward subscribers. We can reward donors. So is this the kind of thing that you get involved with yes, in wearing absolutely. your various hats? Well, actually, most of this is something that our Internet Oversight Committee is looking at, again, collaborating. You're think. talking about the one in the Milwaukee Symphony. Right, right. That, And it's one of the things, maybe the most important lesson I've learned over these many years of activism is that activists and innovative institutions lead by example. That it's one thing to put up an Internet agreement and... And, and we did, and it was an innovative agreement. It was an important step, but nobody used it until all the pieces came together for us. Really, two years, two or three years after anyone else could have done it, all the pieces came together for us, and we jumped on it. And that was a door we could have walked through two years before, and so could L.A. and New York and about ten other orchestras. We just happened to have all the pieces in place. But that, you know... That may have had more impact on the field than it probably did, than anything I did as Exxon chair or, you know, and, and yet, you know, those positions are important too, but the field needs pushing from the grassroots. Absolutely, and especially now that that's become a factor in culture nationally. Right. I think the Internet plays a big role because anybody can put something up on the Internet. Mm -hmm. And now you have companies asking their customers to make commercials for them. But here we are talking about some new marketing initiatives the Milwaukee Symphony can take. Let's put the stuff on the web ourselves right. so we <clears throat> harvest email addresses and musical preferences from people who we would like to contact and tell to come to our concerts. Who suggests that in the course of these discussions? Traditionally, you would be playing your viola, and the marketing director in his or her office would be coming up with a plan like that and probably not even holding a meeting to tell you about it. But well, now I think case, things are moving much more fluidly. Well, they are, but it's, you know, again, it's a question of initiatives needing champions. You know, 30 years ago, there was a bassoonist in Detroit, a guy named Paul Ganson who became the champion of the idea of taking Orchestra Hall, which at the time was this rat-infested, filled with pigeon-dropping, basically empty, half-open box, and turning it back into a hall. And it was more his initiative than anybody else's that probably made that happen. I mean, one of the things I think about musicians that, I won't say annoys me, but, but exasperates me, is that we're trained to be very passive. You know, we're trained to sit there and wait for the conductor to start and stop and tell us when we can get up and sit down. And I think that really does take a psychological toll on people. That was that article that we were talking about was largely about that. This is an article that... In, in, it was Harmony. It's on the Polyphonic right. website. It's a, it, the title of the article was Why They're Not Smiling. And it was an exploration of... An article by you. By my father and me. By your father and you. My father, and your father was... My is, father is, um, was one of the founders of the field of developmental psychobiology and did a lot of the early work on theoretical work and experimental work on stress. And my theory, our and theory his name? was... Seymour Levine. Okay. He was, he's a professor emeritus at Stanford University. He's currently at UC Davis. At the age of 80, he's still working. Good for him. Which is something I dream about, not being 80, but working at that point. Um, and the theory we had was that the, the problem with being an orchestra musician was you had training and talent and intelligence and drive, but no control over, the, over your environment. And it turns out, actually, there's tons of experimental and anecdotal work to demonstrate how harmful that is, both psychologically and even physiologically. Um, I mean, to take a very simple example, some studies done in nursing homes show that people that, for example, that have the chore or are given plants to water and take care of die at about half the rate of people that don't. Just even that level of control. Uh, there was a classic experiment, which was my favorite, of people exposed to what they called noxious noise, which actually was jet engine noise. 
and they were given, uh, you know, one group of people was just exposed to this noise, and the other group of people was exposed to it, and they were given a knob that they were told would control it, would control it. Well, it turns out that the people that had the knob could tolerate about twice the level of noise, even though mm. the knob didn't do anything. The knob was not connected to anything. Even the illusion of control reduced their stress and increased their ability to tolerate this noxious thing. Well, I think one of the psychological effects this has on musicians is that they forget that, I mean, not to sound trite, but anybody can make a difference. I mean, nobody... If, if one waits for permission to start going out there and trying to change things, you're going to wait for a long time. And sometimes you're going to get opposition, but very seldom is somebody just going to say, you know, shut up, you shouldn't be doing this, this is not your job. That's not been my experience Although generally. it certainly helps if the situation itself is fluid. It's true. And changes are happening. It's true. And, and one of the pieces that happened in Milwaukee was that there was this desire and hunger because we were in the process of beginning to turn the institution around. We had some new management. And they were very anxious to jump on things, you know, that, that, that could look like there was change. And the Internet is something that we are still in the process of figuring right. out. Right. So anybody's opinion is at this point more or less as good as anybody else's. Right. Let me, completely out of left field, bring up a discussion I was involved in with a group of orchestra musicians about another area where change seemed to be a good idea, but nobody could figure out how to make it start. I was talking to people from the Pittsburgh Symphony, um, New Jersey, New Mexico, and Richmond, I think, and there was management from another orchestra, but I think everybody else was a musician. And the subject was the feeling that was unanimous in the room that musicians don't look lively enough on stage. So that may be debatable according to some, but it was a feeling here that it'd be nice if musicians reacted to the audience, smiled, looked like they were involved in the playing. And then the question was, how can this, how can we start changing this? And the discussion, I won't say people were negative. People were really cheerful and having a great time. But one of the first things to be established was that if management decided to make this a priority, that would be the kiss of death. I naively, sitting as an observer, asked what would happen if the board said they wanted this. The person from management, somebody really capable, said, the normal agreement says that the musicians must abide by any reasonable request of the board. This would be considered unreasonable, and the musicians would file a grievance. So it became clear that the only initiative could come from the musicians themselves, but the musicians weren't used to doing this and didn't have the institutions to do it. So one principal second violinist said, maybe I could organize my section. Somebody else said, maybe I could go to the people who are most recalcitrant on this subject and try to change their minds. Here is something that is not in flux, but people wanted it to be. Right. How can orchestras adapt to the need to change things like that, that there don't seem to be mechanisms for changing? Well, that's a tough one. Um, it's interesting because I, I can see if that had happened to my orchestra and the management had come and said, you know, it is now part of your job to move and look interesting and you have to smile. I mean, I would have been the first person to have filed a grievance because as a union official and to some extent just as a musician, my first thought would have been, and what did they do to me if I don't? Because, in fact, a lot of what unions do is, is think about worst cases. I mean, we have, in a sense, it's like a defense attorney. I mean, you have to think about what's the worst thing they can do to you if it doesn't happen. Where does this, yeah. where does this path go, potentially, that's really but bad? no matter what the intentions are behind it, management would be making a naked power grab because 
until further definition of the situation occurs, they appear to be saying that they can decide yeah. what the proper behavior and is and what the sanctions are right. and who decides right. whether anybody should be sanctioned for not doing and this And as thing. a matter of principle, the musicians and certainly the union would resist that. Right. Uh, just because we wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't. We wouldn't right. be protecting our members. That's not to say, I mean, one of the things that's been interesting for me about being a union officer is we have so successfully trained management over 50 years. It's such a unionized industry that the only people, well, not only, but generally the people one ends up defending are people actually that have misbehaved. But, you know, if you don't defend them, you can't defend anybody. So often it's like being a defense attorney. You end up defending people that really probably were guilty of doing what they do, but they still have rights. But I think, yeah, it does have to go back to the players. And, and how do you empower the musicians to talk among themselves? Because they even will have some of the same suspicions. There's some of the people in the seconds that say, well, who's the principal second to be telling me, is he in bed with a conductor? You know, are they all talking? I mean, metaphorically. Um, you know, is this all a plot to get us old, old farts back here fired? And again, it's a consequence, I think, of being in a situation where you have no control that paranoia reigns, that, that musicians tend to paranoia not because they're paranoid people, but because the workplace is, on some fundamental level, so dysfunctional and so inimical to mental health and normal relationships. My own protest against that, and it's easier to make as a principal, is that I talk to conductors. I even talk to the music director. You know, I'll, I'll make a joke. I mean, I just, I refuse to sit there and shut up. Now, on the other hand, nobody has said to me, shut up. I mean, if they did that, I probably would. But, you know, I, I, I don't like the relationship, the, just the passivity. You know, if I have something to say, I'll try to figure out a way of saying it within, you know, I'm not going to tell them that the winds are out of tune. That's really not my job. But if there's an ensemble problem that we're involved in, I'm going to take some initiative in raising it with him. But even that is fairly unusual in orchestra. And if I wasn't the principal player, I couldn't do it. And, player, I couldn't do it. And in fact, very often you get people, I believe, taking the opposite position. There's an ensemble problem with the violas, and that jerk on the podium doesn't even notice. Right. So screw him. Right. 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 Screw him. If he, if he can't fix it, we're right. not going to fix right. it. And then you hear the recording, and it's not together. And, and yeah. who likes that? Yeah. And uh, who gets blamed? Yeah. The orchestra, actually. Yeah, but yeah, I, that's true. But even if it wasn't the orchestra. The point of the whole exercise, which is to put on a good concert, yes, has been undermined. Has been undermined. You know, regardless of whose fault it is. I mean, I you know, part of an orchestra job is making a conductor look good, sometimes better than they are. And you know, it's like playing deliberately out of tune if you think the conductor can't hear pitch. I mean, that's just you know, it's professional malpractice. So now we have entered a really big topic just at the time that this conversation <laughs> is probably ending, which is you have used the word dysfunctional. You have said orchestras are dysfunctional institutions. Well, I didn't quite. What I said was that the workplace is in some way inherently dysfunctional. Orchestras as institutions are not just what happens on stage. And, in fact, we've spent 150 years giving concerts, some of which have been very, very good as, as, as an industry, while dealing with this dysfunction. One of the things I'd like to have a conversation about with the field, if there was any way to do that, was if, you know, if there's some basic realities that are affecting us negatively, how do we cope with that? I mean, I... I my own coping came after I left the orchestra business in 86 and went and joined a string quartet up in Canada and did it for a year and loved it, but discovered that being in a string quartet is a little like, it's kind of, kind of self-slavery in a sense. And also discovered that economic security was, you know, at least as important to me as, as enjoying what I was doing. So I went back to the orchestra world, but I decided that I was at least going to try to enjoy it. And what I discovered was, in fact, that one can do that. I mean, it's, you know, there are concerts it's impossible to enjoy. But in fact, a lot of what you take away from a concert is what you bring to it. And, you know, I wish there was some way of being able to encourage people. 
I mean, not to be Pollyannish about bad things, not to be Pollyannish about bad conductors, but at least not, you know, not to be so passive, not not to say it's not my job to make the music, it's my job, you know, I'm not the lead viola operator in the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra plant. I mean, I'm supposed to be something more than that. Uh, you know, there are days it feels like that, but to some extent, that's my fault, if it does. I mean, I can bring things to the job that will make it tolerable and even enjoyable that, that it wouldn't be if I didn't bring those things to the job. And maybe that's part of coping with an inherently dysfunctional workplace is, is you know, changing yourself to some extent so you can deal with it. Maybe just growing up, I don't know. Well, I mean, not not that I've managed to successfully do that, but you know, nor I. But you know, there but, is it, it, you. You can't just walk in and expect everything to be provided to you. No, and I think that's where people. You can't. I go think wrong. here there is a need for some large-scale, long-range change in order to make orchestras sustainable and also. Contemporary. That is, nowadays we expect more from a workplace yep. than we would have in the 1950s. That's true. You don't simply go to work and do what your boss says. Businesses work very hard, the good ones, to find ways of giving their employees real ownership of what they do. And orchestras are behind the curve yes. on this. And I feel that there's even some underground, maybe even tangible relation to the economic problems. It just when you see it, it doesn't quite feel like an institution of now. And it's interesting that the music making itself, when it's really going well, provides an example of what things should mm -hmm. be, mm -hmm. because that is collaborative in every single way. So I would suggest listening to you, and I found this very educational for me, that the work that you and others did working out the internet agreement when there is a need to do something new but no established model therefore giving an opening for real participation for everybody maybe that will open the door to taking initiatives on things where the whole world isn't doing it yet but you have to find within yourselves the initiative for change but allowing that to happen because I think we need it <laughs>